What would you do if you overheard two strangers making a bet on whether you would take your own life within the next 12 months? That was a situation I found myself in a number of years ago. I moved to England from Canada with my mum when I was just a little girl. My mum had wanted to see more of the world and had taken a job as a nanny overseas. When her relationship broke down, we relocated across the water to Kent and in with her mum and dad, my wonderful grandparents. Whilst I don't remember a lot of the early years of my life, I do remember growing up in England surrounded by people that loved me. Living with my elderly retired grandparents and my hard-working single mum was an odd family dynamic, to say the least, but it worked for us. Nan and Grandad would look after me when mum was at work, and the times that we were all together were among the happiest times of my life. As the years passed, we sadly lost my nan and grandad to cancer and Alzheimer's, respectively. My mum and I became an even tighter family unit than we were before, and at times, it really did feel like me and her against the rest of the world. When I was younger, I wanted to be a singer. I was accepted into theatre school in London and would regularly attend auditions and perform in shows, no matter what my mum was there. She would finish a 12-hour shift at work and off we'd go on the train to London for another shot at stardom. I still remember the look on her face when I was awarded a West End theatre production role at the age of 13. She was so very proud of me, and I was pretty proud of me too. She never missed a single performance, was always there in the front row, cheering louder than the rest of the auditorium put together. It was amazing seeing her so happy, after seeing how sad and low she had got when we lost Nan. They were as close as we were. There were times when she didn't want to get out of bed and face the world, but she did for me, and for that, I am so grateful. This picture was taken when I was 16. I can remember the day, a friend's barbecue. My mum there with her olive skin and her jet black hair, and me, the pale blonde Canadian-skinned kid. I love this picture. I love it so much because it's the last photo taken of me and my mum. She died a few months later after a short but tough battle with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, a type of cancer. The day my mum died, my world fell apart. Sixteen years of age, and without the woman who had raised me, shaped me, and been my everything, I was so incredibly lost. I went into autopilot. Now, looking back, I suppose it was my way of dealing with the shock. I quit school that day, in fact, stopped singing altogether, took the summer to try and understand what had happened, and I moved halfway across the country. I ran away. Later that year, I went to college and just tried to carry on with a normal life, all the while falling deeper into a hole I didn't know I'd ever get out of. Two years of that numb shock had passed before I really started to process my grief. It was almost as if it had taken me that long to realize that she wasn't coming back. She was gone forever. I started to feel worse and worse, until one day I didn't get out of bed. I stopped seeing my friends, stopped going into work, and I wanted to stop existing altogether. I went to my local shopping centre car park roof and stood there on the edge, staring down at the pavement for what felt like hours. Suddenly I heard a voice. Do you need some help? I thought I'd imagined it at first, but as I turned, I saw a security guard a few metres away tentatively approaching me. He looked as scared as I did. I climbed over the barrier, walked towards him, apologised and said, yeah, I think I do. I went up to the roof that day to end my life, but I didn't want to bring another person into this. The thought of him going home and telling his family what he had seen that day was enough to bring me back from the edge temporarily. The following day, I went to my doctor and I explained everything and was given two words in reply. You're depressed. I was told I had clinical depression and anxiety disorder and was put on a strong course of antidepressants. I felt broken. I felt as though there was something majorly wrong with me. Chances are high you'll be on these for the rest of your life, she said as she signed my prescription. The rest of my life, I thought. I wonder how long that will actually be. A few years of being on the medication, and I wasn't feeling any better, but I was feeling numb to it all, which helped, I suppose. I'd been on them for so long I'd become dependent on them, 
and was now too scared to even think about coming off them. I was in a good relationship, had a steady job, a few good friends, and life was okay. I took each day as it came and tried not to think more than a few weeks ahead at a time. It was around this time that social media had gained popularity, and we started to have a window into each other's lives that we hadn't really had before. I would see friends and people I went to school with out there living their lives, doing amazing things, doing the things I should have been doing at that point in my life if things were different, such as applying for their dream job, going to university, traveling the world, even bungee jumping into the Grand Canyon. I felt a mixture of incredibly happy for them and sad for myself. I wasn't brave enough to do any of those things. As well as being depressed, my anxiety was getting worse, and if I'm completely honest, I didn't think I would make anything of myself or my life. I thought it had all been written for me. That I would always be the depressed, anxious girl with the dead mum, too scared to live her own life. One day, I woke up in absolute agony. My appendix was bursting at the seams. I was rushed into hospital, into surgery. I developed septicemia. I was signed off work. This time, I literally couldn't get out of bed. I was starting to wonder how much more life was going to throw at me, and how much more I could take. While I was recovering, a friend asked if I'd bake a cake for a charity bake sale. Once I'd finished laughing and told her I'd never made a cake before in my life, my mum wasn't exactly domestic goddess kind of mum. Sorry. I thought, why not? I'll give it a go. So I went and bought a packet mix and a block of icing, and I set about making a pudsy face cake. He's a bear mascot for a children's charity. He has a round face. I didn't have a round tin, so I used a square roasting dish, the kind you cook your potatoes in. And after an hour or so in the kitchen, I made this. <laughs> <laughs> First time that Pudsy's ever got a round of applause, I tell you. He's beautiful, isn't he? He was a mess. <laughs> the icing was cracked, the cake was sunken, and it was raw in the middle. But you see, this little cake was special. All the time I was making him, I was happy, happier than I'd been in years. I don't know if it was making the cake, following the instructions, baking something from scratch, or simply that it had been a distraction from my otherwise darker thoughts. I couldn't tell you exactly. But by the time I had finished making him, my mood had completely lifted. I wanted to keep this feeling, and in the days and weeks that followed, I must have baked in excess of 30 cakes. And each time I did, I felt a change within me from the inside. It was amazing. Every time I baked or decorated a cake, even if it went wrong, I was smiling. I would rush home from my day job in an office, turn the oven on. What shall I make today? It was a question that both excited and appeased me. I had noticed that my bad days were getting fewer and further between. Don't get me wrong, I still had them. And when I was low, I was really low. I missed my mum and hated the world. But coming back up didn't feel as much of a struggle as it once was. Being creative, for me, was a better antidepressant than any magic pill the doctors could give me. A few years after graduating packet mixes and working on the decorating side of cakes, and I decided to set up my own business. For the first time in my life, I felt in control. I felt not only did I have a future, but I was looking forward to seeing where it would take me. I had realized I had to begin a different way of thinking. That in order to change and to grow, I first had to accept where I was and be kind to myself. It was this kindness that allowed me the courage to continue. I had spent years always seeing the negative in life, always waiting for the next tragedy to befall me because I had simply accepted that's the way my life was. Then one day I decided, no more. And it was around this time I made another decision to come off medication for good. And it wasn't a decision my doctors were altogether supportive of originally. They said I'd been on them for too long and been through too much to simply come off them now. But my mind was made up. I wanted to be the master of my own destiny. I was put on antidepressants as a child, and here I was an adult, not knowing who I was, not medicated. The first few weeks were tough. My body had to make something on its own it hadn't had to do for nearly 10 years. There were times I wanted to give up, 
But I continued. I stand before you now over four years off any and all mood enhancers and antidepressants and out the other side of what felt like a dark and treacherous tunnel. I still have bad days just like everyone else. Still have duvet days just like everyone else. But I know that those bad days pass and great days follow. Chances are high you'll be on these for the rest of your life. I can still hear the doctor saying that in my head sometimes, but she was wrong. Hindsight is a wonderful thing. Looking back on everything that happened to me in my teenage years, I've come to understand it more. As the saying goes, you cannot control what happens to you, but you can control your attitude toward what happens to you. And I firmly believe this. No longer was I going to be a victim of my own circumstances. That what happened to me was awful, but I had to evolve and to grow and to change my thinking, or else I would be stuck in that moment forever. Coming out of the other side of something like this is a mixture of giving yourself a firm but friendly hand and giving yourself the space and love to come out of it in your own time. I believe that courage comes in all forms. Even quiet, subtle courage that you may not notice at first can lead to greatness, such as getting out of bed, washing your hair, going for a walk, baking a cake. Sure, it's not bungee jumping into the Grand Canyon, but it's still brave, especially when you've got that voice in your head telling you that you aren't worth it. Just the courage to continue when all is against you is sometimes the strongest courage of all. What would you do if you overheard two strangers making a bet on whether you would take your own life within the next 12 months? I heard that conversation about me on the day of my mother's funeral. When I first heard them, I thought they would be right, and they nearly were. I had no idea how I was going to carry on my life after that day. But I am so glad I found the courage within myself to continue and to prove them wrong. Both of them had lost that bet, and I had won. Thank you. <laughs>